When the world gets better, let's build a better world. Of better values and choices. With cleaner homes, cleaner energy, cleaner coastlines. With better products from better materials. Using less, but giving more. When the world gets better, let's just get better and better. Miele, immer besser. Hey there, welcome to Interfed System. What was that? <laughs> so, we've had a big week here. We've done a, done a lot. We've received a beautiful table made from a cypress tree in Ballarat by Aaron Moore Furniture. Joe spent most of the week there making plates. Do you want to tell us about the plates? Yeah. So we, um, I went up there on Wednesday and we took some of the offcuts from a lot of the uh, work amongst the house. And we started off by cutting them into lengths and then routed them out. Or I think that's what it is. Yeah. Cut them into circles. Then we sanded the edges, then we did the router around the edge of the plate, and then we got onto the lathe and carved them out, and then we served on them on Friday, which was pretty amazing. I've yeah, never made actually, a plate before. I mean, we actually did our first trial run um, on Sunday, on Friday with a bunch of blokes that are guinea pigs, and um, it went all right, I think, yeah. It was good. It was... Um it was interesting to have people in the space and work with it. Um, using the, like the new Miller equipment was pretty awesome. The stove, uh, the induction top was phenomenal. Uh, the ovens are amazing. So just kind of testing the abilities of all of that stuff was really cool. And the batteries and hardly actually dropped. That, they didn't. We only ran off the sun through that whole time, so the storage didn't change, which was I found that phenomenal. Yeah. Which is a good learning curve into when we need to be doing a lot of our cooking, like at the peak of the day, it makes more sense to get those kind of big jobs like stocks and roasting and all that stuff done. So it kind of, yeah, <laughs> it kind of changes the way I was thinking about the execution of stuff, it was, it was good. Yeah, so most of the heavy lifting needs to be done during the day. And we also, um, yeah, and we've actually now got the full solar system thanks to the guys from Breck and uh, Martin from, uh, who came all the way down from Benalla. And um, that was really exciting to get the solar system up and running and be fully operational from the sun. Um, the aquaponics system is back in balance and looking really good and we're ready to start introducing some fish again. And um, yeah, we, we actually did something pretty special uh, cooking with a really rare barramundi. Um, it was called a golden barramundi and in the wild they only occur one in every eight million. And there's some really incredible Aboriginal art that's been made over the years show, showing this white barramundi, golden barramundi, and uh, there's a great farm in uh, Werribee that has uh, bred them, is breeding them, and we were lucky enough to be able to cook with one of those fish. It's pretty special. It's probably the rarest thing I've ever cooked with, I think. Yeah, and it tasted good too. It was good. Like, I was kind of like, barramundi has a quite a distinct um, earthy flavour. Uh, and this definitely had it, but it was so much sweeter and it was like super succulent and juicy and I didn't brine it. I didn't, it was just literally, uh, we took the life of the fish, we broke it down. Um, we've used everything, all of the offcuts are fermenting away to fish sauce now. We made a really cool sauce, uh, the, like a jus made from the roasted fish bones that we thickened with toasted buckwheat, which is another crop that we're growing. So that was something that I'd wanted to do for a while and it worked out really well. I was pretty happy with that. Um, and the flesh, it was quite white. Uh, the skin was gold and yet gold and white really uh, came up nice and crispy uh, and it was just yeah it was quite delicious yeah so obviously we're big fans of um, finding sustainable aquaponic systems and one of the things about this farm is that their goal is to by 2030 provide the world's uh, aquaponic systems so they really believe in a decentralized um, fish aquaponic systems globally where we actually farm fish where we where people live and as David Attenborough said in his recent documentary, we've caught 90% of the world's fish. Maybe it's time to actually give our oceans a break. And um, one of the things that I really admire about what these guys have done is that they, their wild component of the food that gets fed to these fish is actually down to just 12%. And it's actually mostly from offal and, and fish waste. And they believe they can actually get that down to zero. So um, they're marine scientists that they've got in house are helping us make sure that we've got our systems in balance and able to grow you know really healthy fish as part of the ecosystem because we rely on on the nutrients that the fish create it's all part of the cycle we actually lost a few mussels early on and they said well it's because you know one muscle we've got 20 mussels upstairs one muscle filters 250 liters of water a day and those muscles rely on fish and yabbies as part of the system to create nutrients for them to actually clean the waterfall so we're learning a lot about an ecosystem this house is an ecosystem 
And um, one thing that we're also really blown away with is how fast everything is growing. You know, we've got just You can watch it grow at the moment. It's like yeah. the zucchinis are like getting like a few centimeters longer every day. The beans are really prolific. It's, it doesn't seem like much, but there's a heap of food here. Yeah. Yeah, and just so on other things, um, yeah, we've got some beautiful rugs. A friend of mine, Doan from Loom Rugs, he deals in, you know, really ancient. Some of them are 100 years old. He finds ways of restoring them and revitalizing them. And, and uh, my mate Sammy turned up with some incredible art. Um, you know, this is probably one of my favorites, um, which he stole from when he was uh, in the early 90s. It's really changed the whole feel in the house, having some artwork on the walls. And we're lucky that we painted just in time for the artwork to go up. But it's just made it feel very homely, especially around the dining table. We've got a rug now and, and the table and then some artwork, which is awesome. Yeah. And um, we don't have water yet, but we're getting very close. So I'm hoping that by the end of this week, we've got running water. And then, uh, yeah, we can get close to getting these guys in. So... It's getting really close now. But today we wanted to talk about one of the things that we we've, we've get asked a lot is why. What's the point? Like, why build a house that is an ecosystem? Why grow food where you live? What, what's the point? Why? And for me, it all started with this amazing book. It was written in... Uh, it's actually a summary of work that started in 1918. And uh, it, uh, this book was eventually published in 1934. And this book inspired Greenhouse, Brothel. Um, actually, West, Dr. Weston Price came up with the name Brothel, which was my last restaurant, um, because he believed that based on the work, well, I'll just explain who he was. So he was a dentist. And in the early 1920s, tooth decay in America was rampant and jaws weren't developing properly. So teeth had to be pulled. And yeah, it was, it was just really, really bad situation. And at the same time, the Geographical Society were traveling across all corners of the globe, coming back with images of the healthiest people, you know, with perfect jaws, perfect teeth. So Dr. Weston Price convinced, uh, he was actually head of the Dental Association at the time, and he convinced the board to fund a research trip. And the first one being in Switzerland or in Europe. And that it was, a, they started with a town in Switzerland that solely survived on food that they grew and he thought that that was a really good place to start and then he went to islands off scotland the research that they got from that trip was so valuable that they actually ended up funding another 12 years worth of trips and he ended up getting over 20,000 food samples from um, indigenous populations all over the world people that live near the ocean people that live deep in the desert and um, he's, he concluded that on average healthy indigenous populations had achieve 10 times the nutrient density in their food and much more biodiversity. So some populations actually ate between four and 500 different foods and had real um, wisdom in how to care, how, how to uh, prepare food, uh, carefully would prepare food, would, would eat certain foods at certain times of the year or would um, separate foods for women that were expecting or for men uh, that were at a certain age um, or at a certain cycle in their life. And he was particularly blown away with and in, in awe and respect for the Australian Aboriginal population because <clears throat> that was the only population that he... So at the tooth decay in America at the time was one in three teeth were affected by tooth decay and had cavities. And he discovered an Aboriginal population that had zero tooth decay. So the Alaskan Eskimos, one in 250 teeth, um, which he thought was uh, remarkable, but then when he actually discovered that Australian Aboriginals achieved zero tooth decay across the group, he studied their diet and he said that they had, on average, 12 times the nutrient density in their food and uh, had huge, huge respect for, for their diet. That is one of the reasons why I became so obsessed with growing food because... Um, and, and also the way food's cooked. That's why there's so much fermentation going on and soaking and Matt and Joe and I have experimented a lot with those really ancient methods. And just to give you an idea, like one idea that I picked up at from his work was that a, a bowl of rice soaked for 12 hours can uh, deliver 10 times more nutrients to the body 
than a bowl of rice simply boiled and cooked. And so it's those, those ancient practices that we've kind of forgotten. And so I think that the reason why our food is no longer nourishing us is pretty simple. We, um, we, we've basically mined our agricultural soils globally of the nutrients. We stripped them of the nutrients. And it's because we've grown year on, year after year in the same land. And that's why there's such um, demand for fresh land. That's why there's land clearing going on because the land no, lo no longer produces crops. And we've hidden this because we've been able to use synthetic fertilizer. And just to give you an idea, last year we used over 100 million tons of synthetic fertilizer, which is made from gas and in, 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 a man-made invention. Fritz Haber invented the process. It's called the Haber-Bosch process. And Bosch made it so that you could make it in huge volumes. And that started the Green Revolution, which means that which meant that we, for the first time, were able to feed grain to animals because we were able to grow so much food that there was actually enough to actually start feeding grain to animals. Up until, you know, if you, if you told my grandfather that we would be feeding grain to animals, he'd say, are you crazy? So much work and so much labor and nutrients goes into growing grain. But synthetic fertilizer really only provides three elements. And when you use natural fertilizers, from animals or from humans or from you know proper, properly composted process, you can get up to a hundred different elements: manganese, iron, calcium, all these things that we somehow are low in. And that's the reason why this house exists, because I believe that the quickest and easiest solution to growing nutrient-dense food is to close the loop. And we generate the waste where we live. So why not grow food where we live? So it all goes back to a zero waste system. And the ultimate zero waste system is to grow food where you live, to use the water that we generate and harvest and reuse on, to grow food. And of course, we're using the solar energy. So that is the catalyst. That's what we've been working on for at least five years. And it was actually the catalyst for the first greenhouse in 2008. So really, that is the idea. Grow food where we live, close the loop and that's how you create a zero waste system which mimics nature we create waste nature never creates waste in their systems so last year joe said to me i'm cool with everything that we're doing but the one thing i'm really struggling with is uh, not using milk so um you know joe and matt were lucky enough to introduce him to uh, tyrone brown who's got a great little dairy farm in yarra junction where i was getting my milk and um, they ended up being able to access that beautiful milk and were able to make great desserts, you know. So most people don't have the uh, opportunity to, to access milk from, from a guy that operates that way. So I started looking into alternatives. And of course, the dairy industry in itself is, you know, a huge problem. Um, Denmark, a tiny little country, Denmark alone. I looked this up this morning, but they used 17 million tons last year of soybeans to feed their cows, mostly from Argentina and Brazil. So the, the Europeans are actually drinking soy milk, not, not uh, dairy as we would know it. Um, it's sad that that whole industry, Holland does the same. You know, a lot of the European countries rely on soybeans from South America. And um, to me, it's just the, the, the most, the craziest system really. And it doesn't generate it's not good for the world, but it's not good for the animals either. And the whole thing is subsidized by the government, which makes it even worse. So it's a system that without the, without the European, the EU subsidies would fall over instantly because it, it does, doesn't make sense. It doesn't stack up financially and doesn't stack up from an environmental point of view. So alternatives to, to dairy milk are, you know, there's, pl there's plenty out there. I'm not a big fan of soy milk, um, just for the reasons that so much land is already being used for growing soy. I know most of it's being used for animal feed. Um, almond milk is really problematic because most almond plantations are monocultures and don't have a lot going on on the ground. You know, they're, they're, there are great organic almond growers, but there's not many. And they take a lot of water as well. They huge, huge amount of water, yeah. And there's others like oat milk, which is great, but I came across tiger nuts. And um, yeah, these crazy little little nuts. And I called Joe and I said, I've just experimented and made my first bottle of tiger nut milk. And uh, you know, she, like me, hadn't really heard of it. 
And in all honesty, um, I, I bought some nuts. These are all just raw nuts. You can actually just plant these. You can even buy them in uh, Woolies apparently now. So it's a tuber though, not a nut. It's a tuber, yeah. So I grew it for the first time last year, but to be honest, I've always grown it because it's everywhere. It grows, it's actually just out here at Federation Square, growing in amongst the grass. It's quite noxious, it takes over, right? It... Yeah, it's apparently one of the only things that Roundup can't kill. Can't kill yeah. But the crazy thing is, what, what gives me goosebumps is that we've eaten this for between one and a half and 2.1 million years. So Oxford University uh, did a, released a study that estimates that Nutcracker Man, that the population that lived between 2.1 and 1.5 million years ago got 80% of their nutrients by foraging for between two and three hours for tiger nuts. And they're accessible almost all year round. You plant one of these tubers and you get between 100 and 150 tubers back, so they're almost more productive than potatoes. And they are loaded with nutrients. Omega-3, they're really high in uh, fat and valuable nutrients. And so, yeah, we made uh, milk. I grew some, they grew like a weed. I was really impressed with the way they're growing. Here you can see some that I planted um, early, early um, August. This one, this variety is actually from Africa. So tiger nut milk is consumed in the south of Spain and in the north of Africa, um, more so than, than milk from cows. And you can see how well these are growing. There's the original tuber there. But by the end of summer, this will com be completely filled. And based on, on uh, the guys that I'm speaking to that, are, that have grown them a long time, you only need about two or three square meters to grow enough tiger nuts to give you a glass of milk, two glasses of milk every day. The texture of them is really interesting as well. It's not hard like a nut, but then it's not soft like a tuber. You don't bite into it like a crispy it's apple or anything. Like a, um, it's almost like I can most compare it to a lemon aspen, the native lemon that's um, from kind of the Byron Bay area that has that kind of like connective stuff inside, but then it's kind of, it's palatable for sure. But as a raw product, it's, you wouldn't just chow down on a bowl of them, I wouldn't think. Well, it's really interesting because in the pyramids, uh, Matt um, called me and said, oh, we've just roasted them and, and you did... You Put some spice and salt. So honey, didn't you roast them with honey? Yeah, yeah. Which actually was found in the pharaohs had them as snacks, you know? Mm. Yeah. So that's how long the tradition is of using these. That, they were just soaked, mixed with honey, some spices and salt, roasted, ate them hot, they were, they were great. I actually love them. These have been soaked for about four hours and I really like them like this because they, they had the texture of coconut and um it's very similar to coconut not yeah. the flavor at all but the texture yeah. of coconut when it's a little bit dry and then you bite in and you keep chewing and it goes kind of sweet and uh, fibrous and crunchy so not yeah even though it's a tuber um yet yeah, it doesn't taste like one it's quite they're very sweet so to yeah. make the milk we've just soaked them in water you can do it overnight or we've just done it yeah. for the last couple of hours and then Matt's going to blend them and then we pass them. And the and weirdest yeah, thing... It's also important not to throw the water out because mm. the water actually contains all the microflora because this is a raw milk. This is an unpasteurized raw milk. So it contains all that microflora from the soil, especially the way we're growing them in biodynamic organic soil. Um, if you've ever cooked with bunya nuts, it's very similar to that. So um, traditionally, bunya nuts may have been part of a soup. It kind of thickens. Uh, it's like a fibrous flour, really. You can grind bunya nuts down to a flour, and these are very similar. So we were um, making some milk and then mucking around with techniques to cook them, and I thought, oh, I'm going to see if I can make an ice cream. And I heated the milk, and then we were standing watching it, stirring it, and all of a sudden it thickened like a custard, which was really bizarre. And then from there we have spread it out and dried it and fried it for a cracker, we can use the meal that's left over for flour. So I feel like besides milk, tiger nuts are actually going to be quite an important thing for us. All right. So you can see, um, the little, the little um, dimples in the actual tubers and they carried a lot of grit and that's one of the reasons why their teeth 
they believe their teeth were so shallow from grinding. I love this. So we just added a little bit of extra water to um, blending them so they do start to move. Similar to if you're making almond milk or a nut milk at home. Here's the constitution, by the way. <laughs> Someone's handwritten that constitution on a tea towel. Third draw down. <laughs> Bought it about 10 years ago and still love it. Let me just pop yeah. that in. So you can use every part of this. So we're going to strain it out and, and capture the milk and then dry out this, the fibrous part. We can make flour, um, use it for crumbing, yep. things like that. I'm going to hold that USD or do you want to squeeze and it? And also for like thickening sauces, so we can make like vegetable based sauces and use the dry ground meal to thicken them, which will be really cool. So, you know, through summer we can do like a, a thickish tomato sauce so with different vegetables or... The only thing it. is, it is very, very sweet. Naturally um, sweet, so there's yeah, no... If sweet. you're somebody that loves having a coffee with five sugars, <laughs> this is the milk for you. That's you, isn't it? <laughs> And what I find really uh, humbling is uh, that to know that this food has been used for such a long time. It can be grown without chemical inputs. Um, it's great for, you know, for, for an organic crop or if you want to grow biodynamically, you can grow these easily. But best of all, this is the perfect urban crop because you only need a few square meters yeah. to grow enough for your family. And, and it can grow in all kinds of environments, right? It grows in the Yarra Valley, it grows in Barrison Square, like yeah. all kinds of different yeah. little sub-regions it can grow. Like it's, it's that kind of noxious plant that, you know, it's one of those things that eating the problem, you know, instead of trying to get rid of it. Um, you can you see know. that's quite beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's just like almond milk. And it, it, that actually stays quite crisp and still really tasty, even though usually when you make nut milks, you extract all that flavor out, but that's actually really fluffy and you can use it for heaps of applications and then if you wanted to make a thickened custard just naturally um, you can have it like that or just heat it over in a pot and stir it and then you have a natural custard that's sweet enough to like palatable and this is also like great um you know in like a lot of sort of asian cuisines like indian food they'll thicken a lot of curries and sauces with the nut milk whereas you know we can use this to thicken all kinds of different vegetable based curries uh different different sources, it's a really great sort of asset to have. It's so, really time for a glass of milk this I love it. I think it's, yeah, one of my favorite alternatives. Cool. To, because it doesn't need to contain anything else other than what we've just done. I mean, it is really that simple. We haven't added mm. any secret ingredient. It's just, I mean, you wouldn't probably use um, water from the tap because it's got chlorine in it. So if you can access rainwater or filtered water or something like that, so that, because what you're doing when you're soaking them, you're not only soaking them, even though it's only for three or four hours, you're actually fermenting, fermenting it. So, you know, it's beautiful. And impressive. also because we don't have sugar, where we can find sweet flavors is a really important thing. So we've got a hive that's coming this week. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so honey will be our main source of sweetness, but if we can find sweet flavors, you know, for desserts and all kinds of different dishes within these kind of ingredients, it's a really important thing. And I think the fact that we can make a sweet custard without any dairy or sugar is a pretty phenomenal thing. That was Joey's genius idea. You were there. That's pretty yummy. Well, and there's, and then it, coming back to zero waste, obvi obviously this is, um, a plant that loves nutrients. It grows in swampy, wet areas. So you could grow this in a bathtub at home. This is the sort of crop you want to grow in a wicking bed. Doesn't really like to dry out, even though if you did let it dry out and they, you came back from you know, your holidays in January and, and found that they'd all died, as soon as you put water on it again, they recover. They're really, really robust, resilient plants. So do we need to, if you were harvesting them from grass, do you pick them and dry them and then make the nut milk? Um, yeah, you can pretty much do that straight away. But th these nuts won't be ready till about the Once earliest are, is yeah. March, maybe. So you kind of March, April, May is when you harvest and that's, that's when you get the, the yield out. for the... And then what you could do in that soil is then grow snow peas um, and, you know, and reintroduce nitrogen back into the soil or broad beans. 
mm. and then once once the snow peas are finished after their winter you could plant tiger nuts again you can do that yearly? I know yeah, yeah. De definitely because the thing that they really pull out is nitrogen from the soil and another you know if we go back to this is all about zero waste we use 8 million milk bottles a day in Australia 8 million milk bottles mostly made from plastic otherwise which is even a more ridiculous packaging which is called a tetra pack which is impossible to recycle there's one company in the world that recycles them in Italy and um, you know so we use these this packaging that can't be recycled and then the plastic is coated with the fat from uh, animal fat which makes it really problematic to recycle so it usually gets down cycled or just gets buried in landfill so by growing a few tiger nuts even if you d decided not to grow them you could just have these in bulk in your house and when you need a bottle of milk you can just make a liter of milk when you need it and avoid that whole uh, process of making you know the, the the of buying and then generating waste and if we had a restaurant again i would definitely have this on as an alternative mm. yeah, you know sure. to to well, it's interesting because when we first had the discussion about not using milk i went away and i thought oh, we get amazing milk like tyrone crop rotates his amazing grass he treats the cows really well and i thought but we're getting the most ethically sourced milk in glass bottles which we bring back and it wasn't until you said but you're probably a handful of people who get that and this is about the bigger picture and making it more achievable for everyone not just yep. we're chefs of course we have access to that but i think that's the beauty of this project it's about making things accessible for everyone well, it wasn't, you know, I didn't really think about it that much either. I mean, I did, but there was a friend of mine who went bankrupt. Um, he was, well, he wasn't bankrupt at the time, but he had a huge dairy farm in Denmark. And um, we went to Tyrone and I said, well, you know, what do you do? And he said, well, there's not a dairy farm in the whole of Denmark. He was farming in Denmark. So there's no dairy farm in Denmark that actually farms this way. And for me, he had a farm that originally had 40 cows on it. When he had it, it had 800 cows and the cows never left the farm shed. He actually cut hay outside and brought it to the cows because they were using it. And he said, you know, this is just not possible anymore. The financial model and the inputs and everything. And ultimately, he actually ended up going bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And it just made me realize that, you know, there's so few farmers that actually can farm so that the animals are treated well. They're able to get to a really old age. Like Tyrone's oldest cow is 15 years old and it's just treated like one of the family as it should you know and he leaves mm. the calves on with the cows so that's but that's so rare and it's impossible to financially make that viable for most farmers and you know i think this is a really good alternative that allows people in an urban location even if you've got the smallest rooftop 10 20 square meters you can grow some serious volumes with tiger nuts and have beautiful fresh milk every morning to have with your cereal or whatever you you want to have so that we'll be doing a lot of this um through our time once we move in is cooking with only the stuff that's growing here and coming up with dishes that you could make or anyone can make that are yum and look really cool and but we're it's all coming from here which i'm really excited about yeah i mean this is the whole point of what we're doing here so we've just decided to i want to focus on a bunch of stuff but matt said no let's just focus on one thing tiger nuts yeah. and so we've brought tiger nuts to you today which will be one of um 300 ingredients. So there's over 30,000 plants that we can eat. And most of us eat about three, um, even though we might think we eat a lot more, but most of it's either corn, soy, Not or wheat. Mm. And so if you think about it, you know, we, most of us would be lucky to eat 30 different plants per, uh, throughout the year. Um, as Western Price discovered, you know, the healthiest populations globally survived on up to five, six hundred different types of plants. We've got 300 here, plus maybe a little bit more even. And so our goal is to try and create biodiversity, build an ecosystem and a house that feeds you. And um, I can't wait for these guys to... Yeah, actually... well, like we're kind of looking at it like we're creating a new cuisine in a lot of ways. Like an urban cuisine is something that I've never seen before. Like the the restraints and restrictions on only things we can grow in a city is amazing like it, it's all good and well to take you know lavish ingredients from here there and everywhere and you know for the last few years we were cooking cooking from a region that was abundant 
of, of different food sources, you know, everything from livestock to vegetables to, to different, you know, yeah, to fish, you know, it was, it was abundant and it was a great experience to do. But as cooks, this is like the most exciting challenge ever is to cook with only things that we can grow in a city. So it's, it's a really exciting undertaking and like, uh, you know, to not have butter to cook with already, like that's such a hard one. But, you know, by thinking about different ways we can thicken a sauce, like I mentioned thickening the fish sauce with roasted grains, like roasted buckwheat. That's cool. Like that's a right. really exciting thing. The buckwheat out here is out of control. You know, it's just one of those things that I, I've never grown buckwheat before and it's ready in six weeks. When you read it, you go, it can't be ready in six weeks. And now I've grown it. I believe it, you know. Yeah, so just to kind of create this new food and like what we're doing here is like at the extreme level, but we hope to motivate people to do one or two different things at home, even if it's growing some tiger nuts. And like, I'll be honest, like I'll still drink milk from time to time, like out, you know, when you're out and about and like, it doesn't mean you have to give up all of those things. I think it means you can make better choices and choose when you do have it from an ethical source. Um, same with different meats and stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, this whole project, if we can inspire small things to make small changes, that becomes really infectious and really sort of empowering, even if it's growing like a pot of tiger nuts or even a pot of parsley. So you're not getting a little plastic bag. Uh, it's not sitting in the fridge. Like when you start to eat live food, it's so delicious. And from my point of view, like all of this stuff's really amazing, but it has to be delicious. If it's not delicious, it's not inspirational for people to do so you know from a taste point of view we're finding these new flavors that we haven't come across before and it's yeah it's super exciting and you know this is uh, all all the greenhouse projects have been a creative magnet really you you it just seems to attract brilliant people like Lockie tonight is making you know the splashbacks out of old skateboards I've got Chris Bissell's you know collecting um, silver perch and, um, and carp, as well. and carp, and and um, you know, there's we're learning so much. Like even I didn't know there were 25 different varieties of freshwater mussels. I didn't know that we destroyed all of the rivers and and stopped mussels being able to actually exist. You know, because of the way we've managed rivers. You know, the fact that one mussel, we found out that when two of our mussels died, we found out why because each mussel filters 250 liters of water a day. So imagine, uh, you know, what a river, a river like the Yarra River having n not millions, but possibly billions of mussels living. What those mussels are part of that ecosystem. So we've learned so much already and we haven't even started and we've already got an overabundance of food. And you've got to remember the footprint of this building is 87 square meters. We've got a tiny footprint and we already have too much food that we don't know. Like we, the, the mushrooms are growing faster than we expected. You know, we've got beans that we need to pick. We've got zucchinis that are out of control and, and, and we're only, it's very warm and we're only really, you know, four weeks in. And uh, I think that that is, that I find that really exciting. And the fact that we could not be any more in the middle of the city no. as well, like, which is phenomenal. That's yeah. like, that says there's no excuse. Cause a lot of people say, oh, but I live in an apartment. I live here or there, but like, even just like one plant somewhere, you can always grow something. Yeah. Like it, you always can. And it might not be as much, many different things as you like. You might be on the south side of a building. So you have to, you know, get things that aren't really sun dependent, but there's always something you can grow. And I think it's a really lovely thing to be around life and, and things that are growing. And most importantly, it's never going to taste more delicious than when you pick it and eat it. Like I can't like talk about that more. Like I just picked a few beans and ate them and I was like, this is delicious. Like we'll serve that at, um, to, yeah. to guests that come through when we're cooking dinners for people because it's so yummy. It's, and it'll never be better because you literally, it's picked and eaten and you know, it hasn't been chilled down in a fridge. It hasn't been trucked around. It's just at its optimum. Nothing is ever better than when you just pick it, particularly summer ingredients when they're warm from the sun. Like that's just a really special thing. For strawberries and yeah. And it's, I've got this vision that you, I look at a city like Melbourne and all you see is greenery and the laneways and the buildings are covered with, you know, vertical systems and, you know, the laneways have, you know, greenery rather than asphalt and every square possible meter is taken up with some kind of pro productivity. You know, the 10 times more water falls on Melbourne than we actually use. Imagine if we had systems that harvested that, stored that, you know, used. And that also with, aids in cooling down the city. So you like yeah. using less energy to, uh, for air conditioning and stuff like that. Like the, there doesn't seem to be a lot of negatives with making a city wild. I no. don't think it's all positive. Like no. the biggest negative you could, you know, think about is just the amount of food that you had to deal with, which is like a massive positive. Like yes. Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty wild dream, but the more we delve into this project, the more I go, well, 
there's really no reason that we shouldn't be doing this. So there you go, we'll end on that. Um, we, this will be our last live stream until um, 2021. And I, we, we are really humbled by the amount of support from even people that we don't know, you know. So there's, there's a lot of support for this idea, a lot of support for this project. I wanna thank Federation Square that have just been incredible. Um, Aiden, Aiden, Aiden. Um, the team, Lockie, Spencer, Matt. And definitely um, the team at Miela for, for ongoing work. We've worked with them for a long time, but they've been really supportive. Um, and Bolter Brewery for making sure there's beers for all the builders and for us. And yeah, just there's some really lovely people around that are really, you know, there's been a lot of like ups and downs and hard times through this project, but I think the support in the community really keeps us motivated and keeps us firing. So thank you very much. For I, that. I know there's, I'm just thinking about all the people like the plumber, the, you know, we've used, this has got no PVC. You know, the electrical guys, Breck Energy, who have done, you know, the electricals without PVC. Um, yeah, Andrew's made all the kitchen, the furniture. I mean, you know, when you ask a furniture make, maker to actually fell the tree, cut the tree, mill it, um, solar, you know, it's gone in a solar kiln, he's dried it, he's made all the chairs, the tables, the kitchen, the joinery, it's a, the grow lights. We've got six um, to show you. Yeah, so, you know, there's a lot to show you and there's a lot that's going to happen over the next six months and 2021, we are so excited to actually, um, you know, hopefully get you um, access as well and be able to, you'll be able to book tours online. So thanks again for your support this year and we can't wait till uh, next year. Bye. Cheers. When the world gets better, let's build a better world. Of better values and choices. With cleaner homes, cleaner energy, cleaner coastlines. With better products from better materials. Using less, but giving more. When the world gets better, let's just get better and better. Miele, immer besser.